Okay, so what is a span? Well, given a vector space V and um, and um, a subset subset um, S, um, the span of S sort of implicitly in V equals like if if the um, if this is composed of say some vectors, then it's going to be a times v one plus b times v two plus c times v three, and say if there's say if there, say it could be any number, but let's just write three so so it doesn't notation doesn't go. So this is. Where A, B, and C are members of R. We could write it up to N. Like we have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. And you could have A, B, C, D, E. You could have any number of in this linear. So this is a linear combination of vectors, but it's unrestricted in the sense that there's no restriction on A, B, and C. So, and this is how we've been writing our solutions finally to linear systems is by solving the linear system, we get rid of the constraints and we find a few vectors here. So we can write our solution set as a span. But it turns out that any vector space can be written as a span. And so in that context, then, it turns out that um, not, every span, not every span is equivalent or equal. There's different sort of, um, there's different um, sizes of spans. For example, we know that, we know that every vector space is a span because we can write V equals the span of V. Well, this is a very, this is like an, if, it, all our spans have been like two or three vectors. Well, this is formally a span, but it's like an infinite number of vectors. And you can see that you can, you, you can see so you have to write, you'd have to write this as like a weird thing with an infinite number of vectors. But to show that this is true, just take any vector, give it the coefficient one, give every other coefficient zero, and you'll see that that V is is sort of the span of itself. So that just shows tr sort of trivially and not very interestingly that any vector space is a span, but it turns out that any vector space can be always written as a much smaller span. That you don't need an infinite number. This set S never has to have an infinite number of vectors. Now, this is where um, there is a restriction here. I mean, that's sort of like a definition because there are infinite dimensional, or there are vector spaces that require spans with an infinite number of vectors. So we're dealing here with what are called finite number of vectors in span. So all our vector spaces will we'll eventually have an S here, a set, a spanning. This is called the spanning set. that um, it only needs a finite number of vectors, like up to some number n. We don't need an infinite number of vectors. Um, there's a whole field of math with vector spaces that have an infinite number of vectors. Um, and that's like a, um, a whole other subject. Um, okay. So, the, the, here, so let's look, there's some general sort of pictures that we can look at. Let's say, that this is a this is our vector space V, okay? And here is our set of vectors, say that just has V1, V2, and V3. So usually it contains we're, we're saying that this S only has these vectors. And I'm going to write sets as these circles and vector spaces as rectangle, rectangles. So now, if I so so this, if I wrote all the linear combinations of these three vectors, they're going to be a vector space inside V, right? Because it's a subset, and every linear combination of of vectors in here is inside V. So th this is going to be the span of S. Now it might be that the span of S is equal to V, but it doesn't have to be, right? It could be less than V. And it turns out that so that and, and so if if and even, and the other problem is 
that I can have like um, a span that has lots of vectors that equals V, but, but, there's, but there's more than needed. So there's, there's this idea that you can have two few or too many um, vectors for V equals span of S. So the big idea is going to be we want to find an S that's sort of as small as possible so it's not too big. In other words, if, if there's some kind of redundant vectors that we can throw out, then we want to throw them out. And on the other hand, if it's too few, it doesn't span the space, okay? So we want enough vectors to span the space, but we don't want, we don't want too many. We don't want to have extra ones. For example, let's consider this set of just one vector, okay? And then we can say, well, so this is S, so the span of S equals A V1 such that A is a real number. Well, let's, let's consider S prime, a different set that includes V1, but also includes 2V1. Okay? Well, we can consider the span of S prime which is going to equal A times V1 plus V, this, this is V2, right? Plus V times D2, which is 2V1, such that A and B are any real numbers. Well, well this is sort of, it, it's like I can factor out, this is equal to A plus 2B times V1, such that A and B are real numbers. Well, you can, you can see that th these are really the same set because I can choose any, I can make A any real number. So I, in particular, I can write any A in this form and show that it's, and I can if I choose A and B here, I can get any real number here. So these are really the same set. I, I can't get a new vector space by adding a multiple of one in here, right? Well, you can sort of see that, right? Because if you if each of these vectors, geometrically speaking, is sort of like a line, I can't get more space by having one vector along the line and a second vector parallel to it along the line. I'm just going to get, you know, I'm not going to get any more points or any more stuff that's along this line. I need something that's off off this line to get more to get more space to get a larger vector space. So this leads, oh no, okay. I always press the wrong button. This is one and this is two. So I, up here I did page before instead of page after. So now we'll go to new page after and this will be three. Okay, this leads to the concept of linear independence. So the previous stuff was just supposed to be motivation for this idea of linear independence. Okay, so linear independence is the idea that, um, let's say I'm given some vectors. Linear independence is a property um, of a set of vectors. Okay, so let's, give, let's say I'm given a set of these three vectors, right? Well, linear independence is the idea, con the concept that well, we say these three, we say um, these three vectors are linearly independent. Um, if none of them um, can be written as, as written as linear combinations, none of them can be written as linear 
combinations of the others. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a lot of words. But what it's saying is, like, it's tones that you can't do. So that's why it's complicated. So what it's saying is, this, this means you can't write V1 equals A, V2 plus B, V3. Can't do this. In other words, there won't, you can't find a constants A and B, so this works. And you can't write V2 as A, V1 plus, well, we write different, different numbers here. There's no connection between as C, V1 plus um, D, V3, or, or, or this, can't do this or this, and you can't write V3 as E, V1 plus F, V2. You can't write, you, you can't write any of these like this. And you can see that if you, if you had like, like 10 vectors, it would be, well, you can't write any of them as linear combinations of the others in any way. Right. So what it's saying is, in some sense, then you notice what this is. This would be saying that V1 is in the span of V2 and V3. This one says that V2 is the span of V1 and V3. And this one says V3 is the span of V1 and V2. Somehow it's saying, now I could, if, if I, th these are really equivalent in the sense, look, if I have V1 equals this, V3, I could subtract V and these constants A, B are not zero. I could I could subtract V2 from both sides and put it over here, subtract V1 from both sides and put it over here, and convert one of these equations into the others. In some sense, they're all all of these um, are more or less equivalent. I mean, the possibility is that V1 could be a multiple of V2, right? But then you could write V2 as a multiple of V1. All of these are in some sense the same. Okay, so the concept, I think you see the concept's clear, but how do you, how would you test a set to see if it's linearly independent? I mean, it would be awkward to have to go through every vector and check that you couldn't write it. Because it's like it's hard to prove a negative. So what, you, what it turns out, that what I can do is subtract V1 from this, subtract V2 from this side, and subtract V3 from this side, and convert all of these into a common, a common form. What you can't do is write A V1 plus B V2 plus C V3 equal to the zero vector. can't do this. So you can't, in other words, the vectors V1, V2, 3 are linearly independent if you if you can't find constants A, B, and C such that this thing equals zero. Okay? Now you can see that, let's say that none of these A, Bs, and Cs were zero. Then I could subtract B, V2 from this side and put it on the right-hand side, subtract C, V3, put in the right-hand side, and I'd have the first equation after dividing by A. Similarly, I could convert any of these forms into the forms up here. So if this is, if this is, if this is not possible, you can't do any of this. So this is actually a good test, right? So, how do, but how do we make precise this idea that you can't do this, right? The problem is, how can you, it's like, if you, you can't prove, it's like hard to prove that something's a negative. So what we do is we say, well, this, when is this not going to be true? It means that, well, there is one situation, one solution here where this is true. I can write A equals zero, B equals zero, C equals zero, right? Because zero times this will be zero. So that'll be, so the only time, so what we're looking for is, is when we say we can't do this is, we can't do this for A, B, and C not equal to zero, 
right? If because clearly you can do this if A, B, and C are zero, but that doesn't mean anything because that's just trivial. So the point is because that you can't convert this into one of those if they're all zero. So the idea then is for this test is what you want to do is you want to say this concept is equivalent to the idea that if a v one plus b v two plus z v three equals the zero vector, then a equals b equals c equals zero. In other words, if this is true, um, if this conditional right is an if then statement is true, then V1, V2, V3 are linearly independent. Now, if you can find, if it's false, that means how would this, how is it, this is a, this is goes back to this. This is sort of one reason why, because linear independence is important. This is why I've stressed conditionals, like in the proofs you've done on like assignment two. The idea is how can it be that P implies Q? Um, how can P implies Q be false? Well, the only way way is if P is true and Q is false. So the only way this conditional can be false is if this premise is true, but A, B, and C are not zero, right? In other words, if this is true and we can find non-zero A, B, and C, then they're not linearly independent. You can see that because then if I had A and B not zero, then A and B would be, would be multiples of each other. Okay, shoot I mean, I'm just saying what we do. So, I mean, before, before we were saying that um, um, that A vector one plus B vector two plus C vector three equals the zero vector. And we, we, we want to suppose, we want to say, if this is true, yeah. the only way this can be true is if this is also true. Okay. So, if we can show that this condition is true. That means that if if this was ever true, the only case it's true is when A equals B equals C equals zero. We can't find, there is not gonna be an A, B, and the C that are not zero for which this is true. If, they, if we could find something, then this would be true and they would be linear dependent because I can convert this equation into one of these forms. Oh, so I thought that one of those forms means that it's not linearly Yes, if th this means, this means not linearly independent. But then if you, can, if you can transform that into that that form, then that means that... Yeah, so if we could find it, if we can... Go ahead. It means that if the condition is true, then it can't be linearly independent. No, this is... I use this. Let's say this is true, right? Yeah. Then whenever this is true, yeah. these have to be zero. Yeah. So that means there's no if I there's no way to say that there's no way to write one of these as a linear combination of the others. Mm -hmm. So this being true is equivalent to linear independence. Oh, because if you were to turn it around, then it would be like negative c vector, c vector three or something. So yes. that would be the what we were talking about above. Yeah. So if the point would be that if if some of these were not zero, mm -hmm. then, then this would not be, then this would not be zero. If they're linearly, in, if they're linearly, um, um, then this combination would not equal zero. So the prop, you know, the prop, So the problem here is that it's a subtle. The idea is this: we're saying this is sort of intuitive. I mean, you can't write any of the vectors as linear combinations of the others, and then we can say, well, those are really equivalent to this condition here. But we say, what does it mean to say we can't do this? Well, what we say is the only. We, we, to say we can't do this is to say the only way we can do this is if all the numbers are zero. So we say, well, we, we're going to try to look for A, B, and C, okay, and then try to 
So, so how would I prove how to prove how would you prove this? How would you show how to show linear independence? Well, that means you have to prove or show that this is true. But how do you show that a conditional is true? You have to sh you have to show you have to it's like how do you prove the conditional is true? Well, you assume P and show Q. So that means we suppose we uh, assume or suppose for the sake of argument that um, A V1 plus B V2 plus C V3 equals zero and try to uh, prove that A equals B equals C equals zero. Okay? So if we can prove this, if we suppose this and then prove that A equals B equals C equals zero, we've shown that they're linearly independent. There's no way to write one as a linear combination of the others. So this is the framework. This is sort of the basic theory, the background theory that we have to sort of assume because what I want you to do is, un is understand how to show that a set of vectors is linearly independent, So, you, but you have to sort of become comfortable with this sort of the logic of what's going on so you sort of see what's going on. And, and, um, and the other thing is to realize this, it, this is a... Linear system. We'll do an example, but this will become, I think, a little bit clearer. This is a linear system, right? Because it's, it's if I if when I write this out, this is going to be a linear system. So we're going to when we write it concretely, it will end up being a um, a linear system we solve with Gauss's method. So what's going to happen is we have a homogeneous we're going to have a homogeneous linear system, and we're going to try, and we're going to solve with Gauss's method. Now, if it has one solution. That's, because that solution is going to be this one here, right? Because it hit, because this is a solution of this homogeneous linear system, is a homogeneous linear system. So it always has a solution, namely this one here. But if, we have, if it has an infinite number of solutions, then it will have a non-zero solution. So what's going to happen is, if, if we solve this linear system, if we solve linear system and get one solution that the vectors are linearly independent. If we get an infinite number of solutions, they're uh, linear, we say they're linearly dependent because we will be able to we'll be able to find in one of those non-zero solutions numbers a b and c that um combine those vectors so that they're not so that they're equal to zero but not themselves zero so that that means that the vectors will be linearly dependent one will be able to be written as some of the others so basically linear independence will come down to solving a linear system and determining whether it has a free variable or not if it has no free variables it will be linearly independent. If it has a free variable, it will be linearly dependent. Okay, so here we're, we're just coming back and saying, well, this, this comes down to solving. So you already know sort of the way to solve this. We have to go and sort of, it's like putting the, the language in a different, thinking of it in a different way. It's something you already know how to do. It's just there's a different way of thinking about what's going on and sort of, Converting it into statements about spans of vectors, and we'll we we'll do examples. I think this these are sort of the. It seems probably too comp complicated. It's hard to grasp because you want to, but I want to give you the big picture, the sort of the conceptual picture, and then we we'll do examples, and you can go back and see how this works. Shooting. So what would happen if it has um, the linear system has no solution? Well, it can't have no solution because it's a it's homogeneous. Because we know it has the we know it has the solution 
This is what the ones, if it has one solution, that's it. If, if it's one homogeneous, then, then there, there, there could be a contradiction. And so that, and that would be, so, so this is, but this is homo, okay. So let's do an example, okay? 